Hello, Hui Xian. Hello. Hi. So um, I've gotten to know you um, a few years ago, but I think it would be great for the audience to know a little bit about um, yourself and how you came to the practice of photography. Well, I studied sociology, my BA and MA um, are in sociology, but so after I graduated from uh, NUS, I went, I became a writer in a lifestyle magazine. <clears throat> And then I was doing the arts and entertainment beat. So I was interviewing artists, musicians, writers, um, etc. And that was my art education, actually. Um, and it kind of made me more interested in learning more about art. And, and there, it was around that time where I began to use a camera. But it was mostly to document the people I meet, like um, my travels, um, people I care about. But at the same time, I was also photographing, you know, like marks on the wall, stains on the ground and things like that. I don't think I fully understood what, what I was doing. And I think most people didn't either. Mm, it was only like maybe 2014 where I began to take um, um, photography more seriously. Because that was around a time where it became uh, like a therapy for myself. Mm. What do you mean by therapy for yourself? I think around that time, some personal events happened and I found it hard to write about. So I turned to photography, which is something, <clears throat> a medium I wasn't familiar with. And that made me confront what I was confronting in a more indirect uh, manner. Mm. So could you speak about some of the key moments or discoveries that you made in the process of taking up photography that kind of led you on the path that you are today? Because just now when you spoke about how you spent a lot of time in the art scene and you photographed people, um, that seems a little bit different from your primary practice now, which is a lot about um, landscapes or small elements of landscapes which are very devoid of people. So what kind of like um, made that switch for you? Um, when I was taking pictures of people, it was just for people I feel comfortable with. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't really feel at ease taking pictures of like portraits of people on the street, etc. Um, but when I was, I felt, I realized I felt more comfortable um, taking pictures of the spaces I am in, or objects. Because I'm, I, I just, I don't know, it's just less awkward for me and not draw attention to myself. So, um, I think key moments include, you know, when I want to take it more seriously and I began to approach a few people to ask them for feedback about my work because I was also trying to understand what, what the hell I'm doing. And they began to show me works by photographers like Rinko Kawachi, etc., whose works, whose images kind of are more about a certain way of being, a certain way of looking. And that was reassurance, like, you no, know, it's okay not to start with a clear idea uh, before I start project, that is okay to just just shoot by intuition. That is okay to just um, letting the idea emerges through the process instead of before the process. So that was how I began to to develop the approach that I'm more or less on right now. Mm. You've also described your work before as trying to seek um, resonance between um, what's inside and what out what's outside. Mm. Could you speak a little bit more about? Um, this philosophy. <laughs> I mean, I think you can you can call it as such because it is something which is quite a you know overarching statement. Yeah, yeah. I think if you look at my different different works, a lot of that is based on phenomenology, right? How you experience your body in the world. Um, what's the question again? <laughs> Say again. Like um, you know when the resonance you between about, yeah, in yeah, the resonance between inside and outside, yeah. interior and exterior. Yeah, it's like. Um, if it's, it's about a certain way, um, certain, certain emotion, right? It's not just about um, the inner world. The in, okay, the emotions is, is the inner world, but how do you, how do you express that using what's um, around you? Say a landscape, or even a chair, or even like still life, like a cup of tea or something. How do you show that that emotion in that cup of tea? I mean, like through that cup of tea, right? So that's, that's what I'm trying to, 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 to kind of bring about that resonance between the inner and the external world. Mm. Yeah. I think we can speak about this a little more in detail and with specifics when we talk about your series. But um, before we go there, were there any kinds of like uh, formal or technical approaches that you had in mind or that you adjusted as you were trying to um, think about how to formulate this relationship? 
For which work? I mean, like, uh, were there any kinds of adaptations you made to your photographing technique, or certain kinds of, um, like, did you use different kinds of exposures, or, you mm. know, like, you wanted to photograph light in a different way, like, how, how did you sort of, like, evolve the mm. technical side of your practice as you sought to realise this mm. relationship? Mm. So at first I start with a small compact um, film camera, and film is good because you're not tempted to look at the back of a digital camera, like every time you take a shot. So for me it's more meditative, like you take a shoot, take a foot image, then move on, take an image and move on. Um, and that small compact camera also allowed me to, to move among people or to just walk around and photograph without being noticed. And that was the beginning. So after I moved more into medium format camera, because someone gave me a um, medium format, and that you have to adjust every, uh, say the aperture, shutter speed, everything. That slowed me down. And so the, the process of seeing or working became um, even slower. Mm. I think, and then after I went to, I got interested in darkroom work. Um, so I put away the camera and basically just walking around, collecting found organic matter or something, and taking it into um, the darkroom to experiment. So that project um, kind of, um, became more, has a more direct uh, relationship with materials, I think, mm, that process. Mm. Okay, so um, let's speak a bit about your um, ongoing, I mean, your long running series, The Weight of Air. Mm -hmm. So this is something which I think if, if anyone just takes a casual look at it, they can see that you're very interested in landscapes and um, vast vistas. and also looking at myths, you know, um, your other um, body of work. So they, they depict landscapes that exist in um, climates and, and places that are quite far removed from where we are in Singapore, for example, like in Iceland or in the northern part of the UK. And you were also um, on residence in Yamaguchi in, in Japan. So is this something about these landscapes that draws you, like something about the light, something about the vistas? I think landscapes, um I'm kind of, they, they kind of invoke certain emotions in me. I like their vastness, I like, uh, I like how, you know, sometimes they seem to have stories of their own. Um, I like how um, their life seems to be so long and they move to a deeper, slower time, right? Um, it's just seem, they just seem more mysterious and more wondrous to me. Um, I think in general, nature has this, uh, I have this fascination for nature, but it seems that I'm able to assess that fascination more when I travel out of Singapore, when I'm away from my daily life. And it so happened that when I travel out of Singapore, it has to do with residency or when I'm studying in UK, in Bristol. Mm. And that, how, if, I dis, if I were to describe that fascination, it, has, it can be related to this concept called self-fascination by two psychologists. Mm -hmm. Basically, it refers to a to a kind of um, like a like a fascination that doesn't demand your attention, but it kind of steals bits of it. But it leaves enough room for your mind to imagine, to wonder. It's like you know, just looking at uh, light on the puddle of water, or listening to the ocean waves, or just looking at um, say listening to bird song, for instance. So these are these are phenomena that kind of make me feel calm. I, I seem to be able to assess that more when I'm away from Singapore. Although I think they can be found almost everywhere. Mm. So what was it like when you were like, looking for these landscapes or looking for this kind of quiet or this, this meditative state? Like, did you take a lot of walks and like, look for places to shoot or things that you wanted to return to again and again? Can you talk through how you found these landscapes when you were there? Mm, I think, yeah, I don't, well, I might have a, I don't really have a, like a, like if I travel to a, a place, I don't really have a specific plan. I may say, okay, I'll take a walk in the mountain today, but I don't really have a particular, like, path or something. I'll just go and explore. And it might, it might help, actually, if I um, do the same path again and again, walk the same place again, again, because that familiarity made me, try to be more attentive to what I'm missing out. If a landscape is too spectacular, right, I just get kind of absorbed by that. 
that uh, that kind of beauty that I miss out on the very small things, the very nuances that I think are as important or can be as beautiful as well. Mm. Mm. So building on that, um, you know, when one looks at your images from the series, you, it, it, the focus seems to be a lot on elemental aspects of of nature, like air, water, you know, which you can see from the title. Like, why do you choose to focus on these very granular aspects of landscapes? Mm. I think a lot of people, they maybe at first glance we see the big, the beautiful, the spectacular, but. Um, I want to. I want. I'm. I'm quite interested to to show how beauty can be found in the very small things, the small things that also make up the macro. Um, and I think it's the very banal and a lot of times the the, the stuff that uh, that we take for granted that make up um, that make up our, our lives actually. Mm, the small moments matter. So would you say that it's something to do with how you adjust scale? in your mind, you're looking at something very small to suggest something very big. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that interrelationship I'm kind of interested to explore. But, but I mean, I, I, I don't think I have all the answers, but I like to play with people's perception and the ambiguities. Um, uh, that, uh, that play with scale and that play with ambiguity is what um, I tend to go deeper in, in my work. Yeah. yeah. So when you showed the weight of air both in objectives in Singapore as well as in um, Reykjavik when you had your exhibition there, um, you used different kinds of exhibition strategies like uh, projections or using like uh, projections on a softer material that was like fabric. Um, when you are conceiving this style of presentation, like what is the process that you go through? Do you kind of have this in mind when you're making the work or does it come when you look at the space and then you just conceive how it should be hung um, or in response to let's say a brief by a, a curator or an organiser like just, just talk to how, how you think about that Yeah, I mean I think the first step I take is to look at the image like what is it saying um, and also the, the sound of the image whether it's soft, quiet, um, is it loud um, and what kind of music right? Um, is it saying um, that's the beginning, so that's the first stage. If you listen at the images, they have, I look at the quality um, that they seem to have. Then I try to expand that into a space. For instance, the way of air, um, I think the images are mostly quite quiet. Uh, that, they, there's this delicate, ethereal quality. Um, but uh, to me, there's also this strength, uh, mm -hmm. to me. <laughs> so I wanted to enhance that, right? So I use projections or cloth to uh, convey a sense of otherworldliness as well. Um, so that was an objective. But in Reykjavik Museum, the, um, the space is very bright. So the curator said, you know, um, you can't do projections. So, so I went there, so I tried to printing off fabric instead. And the fabric is a silk light, slight sheen, um, which also have a character that I see in my images. And then, yeah, so I, I so instead of projection, I did hanging of um, the fabric in the space itself. And the space was also a little bit um, curved. Mm -hmm. So if you look at um, the way I installed the work, um, the fabric are not like, like, like straight. They are slightly curved because straight might feel too much like a barrier. Mm -hmm. if, you, if I curve them slightly, they feel almost a little bit more inviting. Mm. Was that the first yeah. time that you worked with printing on fabric? Yeah. So how was that like? <laughs> um, there's a lot of, there's a bit of trial and error, but I kind of am thankful for the printer. So they kind of recommended different fabrics to, 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 for me to test on. And also, um, uh, it was, I, I mean, I got a grant for it, so I was quite grateful that uh, the grant allowed me to take it to Reykjavik. It's like going back. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about um, something you mentioned earlier in our conversation, which is your dark room experimentation. Mm -hmm. So this came into play when you were working on the series Myth, and was this part of your um, studies at Bristol, this project? Yeah. So, um, so when I was in, I was studying photography in in, in Bristol. Um, we, so we had to do a final project, right? So Myth is part of that, but the the genesis wasn't didn't really begin with. Um, 
experimenting with materials themselves. I was trying to print on different materials, on mm -hmm. like leaves or different, different, different natural organic stuff. But it, re it was really quite a disaster. And then you know, I, th I think you might know, you know, um, I was that was like autumn. Then we were moving into winter, so I was running out of leaves to experiment. Everything was just falling apart, literally. <laughs> so I began to. Uh, Start, I began to use tree bark. So there's a certain tree which was kind of shedding bark. So I took that into the dark room, um, did a lot of try, try and error, and I realized it could, um, I could use it to make a ocean. An ocean. Yeah, mm -hmm. like the the tree bark could reference an ocean, mm -hmm. and that um, again that ambiguity, that play of scale, that that exploration of perception, mm -hmm. is something which I was already. Uh, working on in my photographs, so that was that's the continuation of my work from um, a practice that uses a camera to a practice that uh, tries to put the camera away, um, and that was the beginning of myth. Mm. So why is this series called myth? Because um, the visual vocabulary of myth, uh, if you look at it, has a lot to do with like say geological phenomena, uh, the cosmological, so bigger stuff, right? Because um, and these are things that have always inspired uh, different cultures around the world to think of the divine, the, the, the spiritual, the transcendental, or you know, whatever, right? <laughs> yeah, <it's a> <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Whatever, the unknown. And I, want, I wanted to use, the, use that vocabulary mm -hmm. to, to evoke people to, to think about forces beyond their own individual lives and think of how they are connected to, to, to this other, otherness. So that's why, um, that's why I use that, that, I mean, those, those symbols. Now. And myth is because it's a reference to creation myths. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I personally found it very um, haunting how you really use very discarded organic matter to create an impression of something that's so vast and beyond and it's like light years beyond. So, so that was very effective for me. But could you also speak a bit about maybe how these experimentations in the dark room, if perhaps changed your impression of what light and exposure is for your photographic practice? Mm. I think how I see light and exposure. Mm. Um, so when I was, so I, when I'm using a camera, I'm really quite at the mercy of the weather, right? right. Light and shadow and whatever. Because I, I do work, work mostly in the landscapes. But in the dark room, you can manipulate. You can play with light. I, so one instance, I can be using the enlarger light. Another instance, I can be using torch light. Or I could be playing with the room, the studio, the dark room light. Uh, so there's, I feel a little bit freer. It's because uh, it's, it's more manipulation. Um, then a little bit more manipulation than maybe documenting or this yeah i would say that mm -hmm. so how about the way that you chose to present it because it was hung i mean it was kind of framed in um and hung in rather like a salon style where there were different moments um captured on one wall but what was your thinking behind doing that arrangement for the exhibition part of it Mm. So I think in myth, I'm, I'm kind of interested in how bits of matter can uh, interact with light and light sensitive materials, right? Um, but for me, the story is still open-ended yeah. and open association. So that's why it was a kind of uh, open layout. Mm. But I'm still tr I'm, I'm open to um, having to present the work in different ways. Yeah. So it, it might shift again. I don't know. So it's considered an ongoing series for you? Yeah, I th it might be. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, would it be quite tied to the material that you found while you were um, in and around Bristol? Like, is it important that it be those particular elements of the landscape or, or can any kind of landscape do any rock, any bark, any piece of sand or something? I think some materials work better than others, yeah. Um, the, it's not exactly very specific. This work was, was started in Bristol, but it was developed in Japan as mm -hmm. well, right? Mm -hmm. um, but not every materials are able to evoke a certain vastness 
so it's a lot of try and error. Mm. Okay, so I think that's a, a nice place to kind of segue to you know the work that you presented in commerce space. So you know, speaking about your experimentations with um, the dark room just now and different kinds of exposures, right? In this place, um, what kind of takes part of place is a little torchlight that helps to create um, some effects in the room. So perhaps if you could just describe in a very um, simple and brief way, like what is it that you're actually seeing? when you go into into this gallery space? Mm, if you come to the gallery space, you might see uh, at first a, a, a circle of light on the floor and then a, a light room, a, a light box, uh, which looks like, like a cut or maybe a, a, I don't know, a sharp light cutting through. And then after that, your attention might, be, might, might go to a reflections on the wall, water reflections on the wall. It's interesting because here, you know, like you, you basically what creates this work is, is this light, this reflection that's bouncing off different kinds of surfaces. So, so how did you, how did you come to, to the idea of like working with this um, dripping water that is created by this ice block that's suspended above this um, torch light? Like what was it that, that made you, about this space that caused you to take this approach for this work? Yeah, I think before this, the show was supposed to be in April and then it got postponed to August. Mm -hmm. And before, like between March and July or something, me and Robin were brainstorming different project ideas or different exhibition ideas. And then I came to a space in July and I realised you know, I was really intrigued by the rawness of the space. And, and I really liked the floor for some reasons, like the marks on the floor and the, the surface of the floor. And I realised you know, if you shine a torchlight on it, a certain type of torchlight. There's a there's a effect that made me feel a certain way on the wall. So I began to work with that, like pouring water, experimenting with different lamps or, or things like that. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. So I I mean for for myself when I went in, I felt that I was um, transported to a cave, which is a kind of like a natural geological phenomena. So it's, I mean, it's interesting for me how it relates to some of your, your work on landscapes and you know, the small elemental things about that. I mean, was this something that you were conscious of when you were trying to um, play with various ways of presenting, presenting this light and this reflection? Like, were you thinking of mm. geological formations as well? Yeah, I found like, um, I mean, isn't it, after I poured water on the floor, I realised, you no, know, there are some, um, there are some effects I want. Then I was thinking, you know, how do I make the water move? Mm -hmm. I remember Roping suggesting like using a fan. Then, then I was like, then we were thinking, hmm, maybe not. So, so it was a lot of um, playing, and then I, I realized I'm actually maybe trying to make a cave, and that is perhaps linked to a memory I had um, in Japan when I was in this dark cave with a low ceiling and walking through icy water and just with a torch like and there was like fear, but there was also things like uh, inner peace. It's a very weird mix of feelings and I was kind of trying to maybe convey that as well um, to anyone who walks into in that space, in common space. Uh. I feel like you almost brought a little slice of the landscapes that you've been photographing before in your previous work into a place like Mayfair Building, so that was very intriguing for me. Um, but let's go back to that little slice of light that is in the light box. Um, what is it that's is that in the image? Mm, it's actually in a dust. It's actually light coming through the window in a in a dust of a dusty room. Mm. Mm. But again, it's that relationship between the inner and the external. Yeah, and that intense glow, intense glowing light versus the very soft, gentle moving light. Because I was trying to kind of animate the the light, kind of make light have a sense that as, as if it's alive. Mm. But sound also play a very important part in this work. Mm. So how does it play an important part for you? Because to me it is also a, a sound piece. Mm. I think the first thing that um, a viewer, sent, like someone who walks into a room, may realise is the, the water droplets dripping onto the puddle. Mm. And that is enhanced by the echoey space. And I, 
I wanted to make it mesmerizing. So the position of the water droplet is kind of, is kind of important. Like if there's not if it's at a, if it's not at that spot, it might be too soft. If it's like somewhere else, there might be no sound. Um, that's probably the first thing uh, someone notices. But um, the sound that a body makes is also important. So someone may feel you know the back rubbing against clothing, the sound of footsteps on the floor. And all these are, are, are designed to make someone feel aware of his or her body, um, whatever sensations, whatever emotions, and then connect that with the work and the space itself. So again, it's that resonance between the inner and external world, um, and the sense of in between, um, and between this world and maybe another world, that I think are in my photographs or in my mm, darkroom work. Mm. It's, it's also a durational piece because um, basically the, the water will drip as long as the ice block that's suspended above is active. So um, is this kind of like durational or almost performative um, genre something that you're also interested in exploring in, in your work? Yeah, I think time is something that I, I am quite interested in, but it's not something that I consciously um, try to bring out. But being in the present moment is, um, is an important aspect of how I work and how I present the work. It's true that there's a, it's like marking time, the dripping of, of um, the water is like tap, tap, tap. Almost like the ticking of a clock, right? Or even the inhale, exhalation of, a, of, a, uh, of your breath. But at the same time, I want it to be so, to, keep, to, to hold your attention so much that you are just in the here and now. You're not thinking of um, what you have to do next. You're not thinking of rushing elsewhere. There's nowhere else to go to, nothing else to, to do, but just here in the present moment. Um, and which is, of course, a very part of how I photograph, how I work, as a child, you know. Um, so the, the presentation of the work will hint, I want the presentation of the work to hint at that and to convey that, um, that, uh, that quality, you know, that um, just being here, just being, just, just, that like you're just being, there's, you know, I, I don't really know how, how else to describe it. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, what you speak about is kind of like in what an ideal audience member would feel, um, and, and the work really puts you in the present. So. Um, there have been some audience members who have experienced this work so far, so I think that um, kind of like audience activation is also an important part of the work. What are some of the responses that you heard from people who are in the space? Yeah, I find it quite interesting to watch. I think some of them, at first they come in, you know, talking loudly, and then began to whisper, which I, which I find quite intriguing. So it's like, again, being conscious of your own behavior, of your own body, of your own bodily presence, right? And then some people begin to sit on the floor and they were in with the work for longer than I expected. So that was also very moving. And I had people like um, my family members who are really not into art, <laughs> but they came and then they tried to understand the work. And yeah, and, and they, they are willing to just sit and be there, which is, for me, the most ideal response. Mm. Yeah, and um, you spoke a little bit about how you conceived this work together at Roping when you came, but um, given that we are in a rather um, busy and active industrial building, and this industrial building is set in a cluster of like uh, other industrial buildings in the estate, like, did this play into your thinking when, when you were conceiving this work in this space? Like, almost like a concentric circle of presences, and then you kind of come here and then, you know, like, this work is there, and it's just you and the dripping sound. Like, how were you thinking about the broader site specificity of, of this gallery? Mm, I think if you're outside, yeah, there, it's true it's a very eclectic mix of tenants, but I wanted to create that kind of, um, to kind of juxtapose that so you just come in and it suddenly it's quiet. So that in my mind, that's the way I envision it. And it's also, I was also quite curious about the temple opposite. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a way of, um, it's a spiritual practice, right, for them. And this, this work 
it's also for me like a spiritual practice. So, oh, I don't know, <laughs> should I say? I mean, like, it's just, I don't mean to sound pretentious or anything, but for me, um, learning how to be still uh, is a lesson, is a practice for me. Uh. Mm. Well, one of the reasons why we are actually um, doing this talk as a, as a video talk is mm. because um, of the circumstances that we are in now, where we are all in the midst of a global pandemic and we can't meet people as we used to. So how has um, this time uh, changed the way that you are currently approaching your work or how do you think it will change the way that you do approach your work in the future? Mm. I think like the COVID situation has of course brought a lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, worries, a lot of, like this big unknown and uncertainty, right? So in a way, the darkness uh, of a cave uh, is also a reference to this unknown, the unknown um, uncertainty, etc. But what I'm trying to, uh, what I hope to convey is also like you know, whatever internal struggles that we may be facing right now, it's always possible to reach that space of lightness, of inner quiet. Um, I like to believe that. Uh. I don't know if it's true. Yeah. Okay, so your practice so far has really seen you work with a variety of approaches, ranging from you know like digital photography to film, and also experimenting with how um, light works in a dark room. And now in this exhibition, just using the light to render its penumbra, what you're looking at, and you know like really immerse a uh, viewer in the space as we've just been talking about. So given that you've kind of reached this point at this time, um, where do you kind of see yourself going next in terms of like your experimentations? I think I'd like to um, further expand my vocabulary um, in terms of art making, of course. And I'd like to hold my skills in installation. And this, um, this work in common space has actually been an opportunity to opportunity to to experiment and for me to take risks which I might not be able to if I have to do a work in another space. Yeah, so this I'm quite thankful for. Uh, as to where concretely I, I may go, I'm really not sure. But this is like a broad direction I hope to, to expand in. Mm. I'm looking forward to seeing more from you. Uh, I hope there will be more of <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you so much. It was really nice talking with you. Uh, thank you, Ishan.